kind introduction, uh, Sheikh Dr. Kamar Hal uh, Bawi, uh, Dr. Muhammad Al Ghazali, Vice Chancellor uh, Zamaruddin Shah, Pro Vice Chancellor Sayyid Ahmad, Excellencies, distinguished scholars, their faculty and the students, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to extend my deep appreciation to the Aligarh Muslim University for inviting me as a guest of honor to, to participate in a very timely international conference on the intellectual crisis of the Muslim Homa, rethinking traditional solutions. I also wish to thank Professor Rashid Shahs for his leadership and initiative to convene this overdue conference, facilitating our gathering today to discuss the root causes of and find durable solutions for overcoming the crises that have engulfed much of the Muslim world, from Afghanistan and Pakistan to Iraq and Syria and beyond. Of the four thematic questions posed for provoking thought in open-minded discussion, I found the question of is a united Islam possible more relevant to the Afghan context which has been shaped by regional and extra-regional players largely involving Muslim countries or countries with a sizable Muslim population, like India. Through a discussion of our brief history in a regional context, I will make a modest attempt to answer whether a common religion can unite nation-states. And in fact, I will argue based on Afghanistan's 36 long years of suffering and victimization in the midst of Islamic states, that nation states, regardless of sharing a common religion, are essentially realist and work to advance their self-interest in the international system. In other words, they no longer consider themselves as members of a supranational community, namely Oma, with a common history even though they may selectively invoke the teachings of Islam to achieve their mundane political and strategic objectives. Ladies and gentlemen, as our president, Dr. Ashraf Ghani, often says, Islam has always been inclusive and reflective in Afghanistan, not violent and angry. And I must say that Islam has also been practiced in Islam in Afghanistan, largely in accordance with the true teachings of our tolerant religion, which stands for and promotes social justice, peace, harmony, and coexistence among humanity. Before the violent invasion and occupation of Afghanistan by the former Soviet Union, our destitute and yet devoutly religious people were content with, with their way of life, exercising greater jihad, jihad kabira and the face of many hardships. They neither fought each other, despite their poverty in a multi-ethnic country with the countless difficulties of a ragged train, nor did they ever venture out to harm others outside of our borders. Neutrality based on strict adherence to the principle of non-interference underpin our foreign relations in general, while we always followed as we do today, the tenets of Islam in pursuing fraternally peaceful relations with all of our neighbors, Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Indeed, this was how Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, conducted diplomacy and invited others to Islam through a message of peace and tolerance. And much like our Prophet, the Afghan people resorted to lesser jihad for defensive purposes to preserve peace and instability in our country. Our collective popular support, collective popular resistance against the invading and occupying forces of the former Soviet Union is a prime example of how Afghans, in spite of our poverty and a lack of means for a modern warfare, stood up against an ideological superpower. Ladies and gentlemen, as you recall, it was with the blood of the Afghan people in the utter devastation of our country that the former Soviet Union succumbed with and withdrew its forces from Afghanistan. 
We believed in defensive jihad against the aggressive Soviet forces and fought it to the victory. And that played a significant role in the collapse of communism as a godless ideology. We proudly defended our country while having addressed the concern of the Muslim world about what some Muslim states termed as Islam is in danger. But soon after withdrawal of the Soviet forces from our country and the fall of the communist regime in Afghanistan, the Islam is in, da in danger narrative proved to be nothing more than a propaganda of realist nation states populated and ruled by Muslims, which actually effectively exploited Islam towards their geopolitical ends. By contrast, however, our losses on behalf of over a billion Muslims for removing Islam out of danger included one, over one million Afghans killed, over two million permanently maimed and disabled, as well as a financial loss of over $100 billion a year for a decade. After much catastrophic losses, the Afghan people naturally expected the Muslim world, the Ummah, to step forward and do their part through a greater jihad of stabilizing in rebuilding post-war Afghanistan. Indeed, the Islamic states neighboring Afghanistan and those beyond our immediate neighborhood had the means to do so. However, much due to dismay of the Afghan people, these very Islamic states did the opposite. They effectively factionalized the Afghan politics and exploited Afghanistan's many post-war vulnerabilities to further rip our country apart in their realist geopolitical games. As you know, the Taliban as a tool of policy was created and mislabeled as an Islamic movement which would restore peace and instability of Afghanistan. But as our people extremely tired of war and violence embraced their deceptive message of delivering Islamic peace and justice in our country, they soon began proving to be nothing more than foreign mercenaries with a realist agenda that ruthlessly, even as we, I speak today, ruthlessly killed and still kill and maim and still they maim our people for years until the tragedy of 9-11. Ladies and gentlemen, in the wake of 9-11 terrorist attacks that also killed many innocent Muslims in the United States, the Afghan people invited international intervention to help us stabilize and rebuild our country. Together, we have ended the isolation of Afghanistan from the rest of the international community, which has immensely contributed to the stabilization and reconstruction of our country over the past 14 years. India alone, despite its own many needs, has contributed $2 billion in multifaceted assistance towards reconstruction of Afghanistan, which we greatly appreciate. Our national unity government leaders, President Ghani and Dr. Abdullah, recently visited the United States and thanked the American people for their enduring support of our efforts to consolidate and sustain our hard-earned democratic gains we have made in partnership with the international community. Thanks to the continued international assistance, never before in our history have there been as many schools, universities, clinics, hospitals, telephones, banks, TV and radio channels, newspapers, shopping centers, and support facilities across Afghanistan as there are today. More girls and boys go to school in urban and rural Afghanistan today than any time in the past. And an increasing number of Afghan women have been empowered to serve in our government and parliament while playing a leading role in our vibrant civil society where they further different societal causes, including the rights of women and children. Ladies and gentlemen, these are just some examples of the significant progress the resilient and enterprise, enterprising people of Afghanistan have made in just over a decade. But these very transformational gains that have caused the lives of thousands of international forces and more than 300,000 Afghans, 
300,000 Afghans over the past 14 years continue to be threatened by the so-called Islamic students. The Taliban were reconstituted shortly after their defeat and collapse more than a decade and a decade ago in a deliberate real realist nation state effort to destabilize Afghanistan. Their aim has been to derail the reconstruction and development of the homeland of more than 30 million devout Muslims who made the ultimate sacrifice and lesser jihad on behalf of the Muslim world against an ideological godless superpower. Sadly, however, much like the ill treatment we received from the Muslim world, particularly our Muslim neighbors, after the withdrawal of the Soviet forces, our repeated appeal for an end to war and violence in Afghanistan have hardly been taken seriously. As we speak, innocent civilians, most of them devout, destitute Muslims in Afghanistan are being targeted by the killing machine of the mercenary terrorists who claim to be fighting for sake of, for the sake of Islam. This is going on even as we have reached out to the Islamic State of Pakistan, which holds the key to ending war and violence in Afghanistan, to help restore peace and instability there, since it is in their best long-term interest, self-interest as a realist nation state. Ladies and gentlemen, the Afghan people will not give up our justice struggle, our continued lesser jihad against any aggressors, be they Muslims, misguided Muslims, of course, or non-Muslims, state actors, or their proxies, in order to defend the sovereignty and territorial integrity of our country. We have learned the hard way through decades of experience, which I recall that even when we have followed the timeless teachings of Islam to the letter, others have repeatedly violated, exploited, and abused them against us and against Islam itself. As we defend our country and our hard-earned gains of the past 14 years in continued partnership with the international community, including with India, we will keep extending a hand of honest friendship and fraternity to our Muslim neighbors and ask them to allow peace and stability to take root in Afghanistan and by extension throughout the region for it is peace, only peace that would enable the nations of our resourceful region to prosper together and coexist in harmony. That is what true Islam stands for. That is what Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, preached and practiced. And that is what the devoutly Muslim people of Afghanistan will fight for until we prevail over the forces of evil and their distortion of a noble religion, Islam. Thank you very much.